My name is Lisa C. I'm a writer and this is my life story. Well, my family, they were all storytellers, actually on both sides of my family. My, on my mother's side, my mother and my mother's father, so my grandfather, they were writers, so I, I've kind of followed in their footsteps. But then on my father's side, which is the Chinese side of the family, they were huge storytellers. And they, the, there were five brothers and sisters. They were all in business together. And at the end of the day, they would always go to what they called the back of the store. It was actually just this little alcove and they would have tea and maybe something a little stronger sometimes and they would tell these stories you know and they would really they were mostly stories about the family but really kind of crazy stories too so I think I just grew up hearing stories and then at the holidays you know when the family would all be together they were always trying to sort of one-up each other with oh, there's that story, but now I've got a better one than that. So I, that's, I think that's it, was that I just grew up around stories my whole life. Mm -hmm. On my father's side of the family, my great-great-grandfather came to this country to work on the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. My great-grandfather came and stayed, and uh, the family originally, they, my great-great-grandfather had a little herb shop. Uh, he was an herbalist, and then my great-grandfather at the beginning, he did a lot of the jobs immigrants do even today. He washed dishes in restaurants, swept up in factories, worked in the fields. But by the time he was 30 in the 1880s in Sacramento, he had his first business. It was a factory that manufactured crotchless underwear for brothels. And eventually he, he moved down to Los Angeles in about 1897. And they, he and his wife stayed in the underwear business for a while, gradually curios, finally antiques, and that business is still going today. It's one of the oldest continuously owned and run family businesses in the state. Uh, yeah, I think my characters do have a lot of strength, and I thank you for saying that you think that they have grace. Here's the thing, you know, if you think about China in the past, and even what it was like for um, Chinese American, for immigrants, you know, and, and not today, but when people were coming over earlier, you know, even I'd say even through 1930s, 40s, even 50s, right, that this, that that it, life was really hard. I'm not saying it's not hard now if you come, but it's still hard. But back, but back then, there were there were certain things that people had had um, that were part of the the structure of the family that made life very very difficult, and that you had no power, you had no say. And that you know, right there, that's another kind of stereotype that we have: is that, oh, we, they were so docile, they didn't couldn't say anything. But actually, within the family. The women were very strong, and for everybody to be here today, they had to be exceptionally strong and be able to bear a lot of hardship and still continue on. So I think of that a lot. I think of their, the bravery and the courage and the persistence in the, in the face of great odds and how people continued on because there really wasn't another choice. You know, either you continue on or you give up. But most people, I think, given that choice, will continue on. And, and that, that um, lends itself to bringing out those qualities, those, those deeper qualities of strength and persistence. The world is always changing. We have to look to the past to find what doesn't change. Do you know her family came from Hunan? She's talking about my mother's 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 mother. <laughs> her name was Snowflower. She had a loud tongue named Lily, a sworn sister for life. One of my books was made into a film. Mm -hmm. They asked if I would write the script. I didn't want to write the script. You know, it's such a different medium. And I don't know that, I mean, I know I don't know how to write a script. I, I think what I'm best at is, is sort of immersing myself in a novelistic world um, where I have total control 
over that world. Whereas I think when you're writing a screenplay or even if it's for television, you know, there are a lot of other people who have a say. But when you write a novel, only one person has a say. Yes, I, I absolutely identify myself as Asian American. I actually, I lived with my mother, but I spent a lot of time with my father's side of the family uh, in Los Angeles, Chinatown. My mother's family was very small. I mean, like really, I could count everybody on probably two hands and today maybe one. My father's side of the family, when I was a kid, I may have had about 400 relatives in Los Angeles alone. There were about a dozen that looked like me, the majority still full Chinese, and then this little spectrum in between. So how is it we identify ourselves? You know, we identify ourselves by the people who are around us. They're our mirror. They're the ones who tell us who we are. And so when I was a little girl and I looked around, what I saw were Chinese faces, what I experienced was Chinese culture, Chinese tradition, Chinese food. Um, so that's, that's why I identify that way. And, and um, but then, you know, as far as Chinatown today, it's very different. And um, the part of Chinatown where my family was, that doesn't even exist anymore. It's gone. So, and the part that they, you know, used to, when I was a little kid, called New Chinatown, now has a sign that says Old Chinatown, but it's still a tourist Chinatown. It's not where people, I mean, there are some people who live there, but it was designed to be a tourist like a tourist attraction. It was designed that way. So that was never a true Chinatown in the way that I think of it. It was, it was just a tourist attraction. I'm working on a new novel called The Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane, and it uh, has a couple of elements to it. I always start with the relationship first. So this has a young woman who gives birth to a girl uh, in China and abandons that child, and then she's adopted here by a family in Southern California. So it's the mother in China, the mother here, and then this young woman. I've been out interviewing um, adopt Chinese adoptees who are sort of between the ages of 21 and 25. It's been so interesting talking to them about their identities and how they see themselves and how they see themselves in this larger American culture, how they see themselves in their own family. I, I feel like I have a little bit of sympathy or empathy for that because, of course, I didn't look like everybody else in my own family, so um, I know sort of what they're, in, in some ways, what they've experienced. Um, and then the other piece of this has to do with history, and because and, I always I, you know, historical novels, so it has to do with the birthplace of tea and pu'er, tea in particular, pone in, in Cantonese, and then uh, the akha, the A-K-H-A, -A, not haka, not H-A-K-K-A, -K -K uh, people, which is one of the ethnic minorities, and they have their own very unique culture and traditions and language and everything completely unique to them. I don't think much has been written about them. Um, certainly no novels that I know of, so I've been spending a lot of time uh, in China, you know, going there and meeting people and talking to people. I was last uh, March up in the Tea Mountains of Yunnan and just going in, out to farms and meeting, uh, you know, spent a couple of days with Tea Master Chen and he showed me his fermenting warehouses and I just did a lot of stuff up there. So. Uh, it'll be really a fun project, I think, once, once it's done. My advice for aspiring writers would be, uh, it's, a, it's sort of multiple levels, I think. So one, of course, is that you have to be absolutely passionate about what you do. You have to love it, I mean, really love it. Um, it's not easy to be an artist for any, any type of artist, right? So you have to have this deep, deep passion because for any kind of artist, and that's, you know, if you're a painter or a sculptor or a dancer or an actor or a filmmaker or, or, like in my case, a writer, there are a lot of ups and downs and there are a lot of people who say no and then there's a lot of criticism. There are a lot of things that happen. People don't come to see what you've done or they, you know, all the things that can happen that are not so cheerful. You have to have in your heart this great passion for it that overrides those bumps or those, those holes in the ground. So that would be number one. And then after that, I think people ha should think about 
you know, I've written mostly about the past, but I think that, and I think there's still a lot of stories about the past that can be told. But there are a lot of stories that are happening right now, and also stories that are going to be coming, coming towards us that we people, younger people, should be writing and could be telling those stories. And I, I hope that's what I'm that's what I'm excited to read and see in the future is is less people of sort of my generation but more younger people who can tell me what life is like for them right now. Mm -hmm.